So well, first of all, thank you, thank you, Jacob, for, for inviting me to give this this talk. So I'm based at the University of Salzburg, as you can see here. I'm an assistant professor there. Uh, and before I start, I would like to do a little bit of advertisement. So it ha it turns out that the three speakers today were co were um, guest editors of a special issue on exactly this topic on infinite idealizations in science. So if you, since you are interested in this topic, you might want to take a look at this pap the papers that we have there. So they are very interesting papers there, not only on infinite idealizations in physics, but also on other sciences like economics and biology. So we published this special issue in 2019. So you might want to take a look at that. And now I can, I can uh, start. So this is joint work with Giovanni Valente and is forthcoming in a volume on contemporary scientific realism uh, edited by Lyon and Vickers. So this, is, this volume is supposed to appear in a few months. So this paper is, is, is there too. And now I can finally start with the talk. So there is one main question in this talk that is the same question of our paper. That is, um, to what extent uh, infinite limits are compatible with scientific realism? So that's basically the question that we are going to ask here. I assume that most of you are, are familiar with what scientific realism is, so I don't want to delve into this, but just for the ones that are not very familiar with this, I will just summarize what scientific realism is about. So scientific realism is the idea that uh, the content of our best theories um, regarding both observable and non-observable aspects of the world is true, or at least approximately true. So one of the most important arguments in favor of scientific realism is the no miracles argument. This argument says that the success of our best established theories would be a miracle if their content wouldn't be true. So we have to trust on the contents of our best scientific theories. And another notion that is very relevant for scientific realism is the notion of approximate truth. So nowadays, most realists would uh, agree that uh, the current theories of physics, for example, are most likely false, like literally false, but they are at least uh, approximate true descriptions of the world. So the notion of approximate truth plays a very important role in scientific realism. And there are different versions of scientific realism that you find in the literature. And there is explanatorianism, uh, entity realism, for example, and structural realism. So the view of structural realism that I will be endorsing in this, in this, um, in this talk is a traditional view of realism. So it's not necessarily a selective realism view. It's a traditional view of realism that accepts the notion of approximate truth. So this is basically the idea that our best theories are true or at least approximate true. And this notion of scientific realism is also very compatible with explanatorianism. That is the idea that we should believe on the parts of our scientific theories that are essential to give an explanation of a certain phenomenon. Okay, so that's for scientific realism. Now let us talk a little bit about infinite limits. So you probably know that infinite limits are used overall in physics. So there are infinite limits in statistical mechanics, in thermodynamics, in quantum field theory that someone mentioned, in quantum mechanics, in the physics of black holes, and so on. So infinite limits are overall in, in physics. In, in some cases, the use of infinite limits seems actually to be essential for giving an explanation of a certain phenomenon. Uh, in some other cases, the use of the infinite limit seems to be essential to recover empirically correct results. Um, examples of these cases, or at least putative examples of these cases of infinite uh, essential idealizations are phase transitions and symmetry breaking. That, are cases that I'm, I'm going to discuss today. So prima facie, from a, from a um, scientific realist perspective, the use of infinite limits seems to be very puzzling. First of all, because we believe that real systems are finite. So if we take a glass of water, we don't assume that there are infinite number of particles there. We assume that there is an infinite number of particles in the glass. 
Uh, and moreover, the finiteness of real systems seem to be a background assumption of certain well-established scientific theories like the atomic theory of matter or even general, the general theory of relativity. So the, it's very puzzling that we use infinite limits and it's even more puzzling that sometimes the use of infinite limits seem to be essential to give an explanation of certain phenomena. So this raises many questions for the scientific realist. The first question is, how can we explain the empirical, the empirical success of models that introduce such an unrealistic assumption like an infinite um, limit, an infinite idealization? The second question is, to what extent models that use infinite limits are compatible with scientific realism? So what I'm going to do today is try to give an answer to these two questions from the perspective of a realist. And since I want to be as general as I can, so I will not focus on a particular example, I will focus on different examples. Um, I will suggest um, a general formulation of what has been called the paradox of infinite limits. And I will also try to build a taxonomy of different uses of, of, um, of infinite uh, limits in physics. So these two steps are going to help us answering the question of to what extent is the use of infinite limits compatible with scientific realism. Patricia, I just want to yes. ask, are you progressing through your slides right now? We are seeing just the first slide. Are you seeing the mathematical limits or just the first slide? We're just seeing the cover slide right now. It's possible you may really? need to just reshare your screen to unshare oh. and reshare it again. Yes, so I'm moving actually towards <laughs> many slides. Um, thank you for letting me know that. Now you you see the slides moving or not? Um, we may not be seeing, we're still not seeing them moving. It may be, um, I, I see that there's a chat message suggesting that it might be because you're in full screen mode. Try going out of full screen mode and seeing if maybe okay. that fixes the problem. Oh yeah, okay. So try moving between slides now. <laughs> okay, let me, now, now it's better? Yes, the other slides are moving. Thank you. So sorry there were many, that. there were many slides going on there. And sorry that you couldn't see them. I hope I was clear enough with my words, so you 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 didn't need to see. I think that slides. was the problem. It was very clear what you were saying, and so it didn't occur to us. To <laughs> slides, but okay, so everything appears to be working now. Sorry about the delay. Please go ahead. Don't worry. This is the cover of the of the volume where where this paper is going to to be published. So that's something that you miss. Otherwise, I think I, I said everything. So I am here. You see my slides now moving, right? Okay, excellent. So in order to answer the question of to what extent is um, a scientific realism compatible with the use of infinite limits, um, I'm going to um, suggest a general formulation of the paradox of infinite limits that in general has been formulated for certain case studies. And I will also offer a taxonomy of different uses of infinite limits. So basically, the answer uh, of that main question of the paper will depend on the use of the infinite limit, as I will I will make clear. I hope in this in this talk. So this is the plan of the talk. Now you see it. Um, it's a little bit ambitious, but I, I am I'm very optimistic that we can get to the end because it's very important that we get to the end in order to in order to convey the message that I want to tell you today. So. <clears throat> As I said, uh, the main question of this paper is to what extent scientific realism is compatible with the use of infinite limits. And in order to do that, I think it's very important to distinguish between different ways in which we can use infinite limits. And in order to understand the different ways in which we can use infinite limits, we need to make distinctions about different types of misrepresentations in science. Uh, for example, John Norton distinguishes between idealizations and approximations in his paper of 2012, and Gottfried Smith distinguishes between idealizations and abstractions. So what we did here is, was to combine these two approaches and to distinguish between the three types of misrepresentation or inaccurate representation. So we distinguish between idealizations, approximations, and abstractions. So what is an idealization? And this is going to be very important for what I want to say today in this paper. Uh, an idealization is a, a fictional system or an imaginary system whose properties resemble the properties of some real world target system. 
So the properties of the, of the fictional system give inaccurate representation of the real world target system, but they resemble the properties of the real world target system. So in the cases of in the case of idealization, what is important is that we always invoke a fictional uh, or imaginary system. Approximations instead are inexact descriptions of the target systems in terms of propositions, and they don't need to, to involve uh, infinite, um, they don't need to involve idealized systems. So in the case of approximations, we can give inexact descriptions without having to invoke a fictional system. A approximation is mostly propositional. We, we don't have to postulate that there is a fictional system that has certain properties. Uh, so this means that there can be approximations without idealizations, which is the point of, of Norton's paper of 2012. And we can also distinguish abstractions in this, in this uh, classification. So abstractions are literally true descriptions of the target system with respect to relevant aspects of the target system. But in this, in this uh, literally true description, we leave out details that appear irrelevant to us. So when we abstract, we give a literal description about the factors that are relevant uh, for the phenomenon that we want to explain, but we omit uh, irrelevant details. Yeah, so we omit information. That's why we abstract. So I will defend that the use of infinite idealizations can be distinguished between ideal, idealization. So the use, sorry, I will, I will claim that the use of infinite limits can be used as an idealization. Infinite limits can be used also as abstractions or infinite limits can be used as uh, uh, approximations. And that is going to play a very important role in the way in which we reply to this question of whether uh, the use of infinite limits is uh, compatible with scientific realism. So in order to show how infinite limits can be used as idealizations, abstractions, and approximation, we need another distinction, which is formal and a little bit tedious, but it really, it really makes sense, which is a distinction that, um, that was drawn by, by Jeremy Butterfield in 2011. So here he distinguishes between different types of limits. So he distinguishes between taking the limit of a system, taking the limit of a sequence of functions and taking the limit of a values uh, of values and sequences of functions. So what is what is uh, taking a limit of a system? So let S n represent a system that is characterized by some physical parameter n, which may take discrete values like when n represents the num the number of molecules, or continuous values like when uh, n represents time going to infinity. Uh, as the variable n grows, that in general represents a physical parameter, one can define the sequence of systems in this way. And one can take the limit of n going to infinity in this sequence of systems. If the limit exists, the limit of this, sec of this sequence is going to be an infinite system. And since this should be interpreted as a fictional system, this can be interpreted as an infinite idealization. So that, that is the way of using infinite limits as infinite idealizations. When we take the sequence of systems, when we take the limit to infinity in a sequence of systems. But we can also take the limit of a sequence of functions, says Jeremy Butterfield. So here we assume that the function f represents a physical quantity of interest. And what we do is similar to what we did before, but we take the sequence, instead of the sequence of systems, we take the limit in a sequence of functions. And the limit of the sequence of functions is going to be the last element in this, in this sequence. And what is important here uh, is that the limit of the sequence of functions where, for n going to infinity doesn't necessarily need to, need to correspond to the function associated with the limit system, which is the limit that we obtain here when we take this, this limit. So these two limits might coincide, but they don't have to coincide. They don't need to coincide. And that's why it's very important to distinguish between these two. But we can also take the limit of a sequence of values. And this limit is going to be very important when we want to check the empirical adequacy of an idealization. 
So here is the same as before, but what we what we do here is taking the limit in a series uh, of values um, that take values depending on the function for n going to infinity. Uh, and here, same as in the in the previous case, we can distinguish between the limit of the sequence of values of the function for n going to infinity and the value of the natural limit function computed when the limit system is in the limit state as infinity. So in other words, we need to distinguish between the limit of the sequence of values of the function for n going to infinity and the value of the quantities evaluated in the infinite limit system. Yeah. And this sounds a little bit pedantic, but it's very important in order to distinguish these different ways in which we can use uh, infinite limits in science. In fact, this taxonomy help this uh, distinction help us building a taxonomy for the use of infinite limits. Uh, for example, we can use infinite limits as approximations without idealizations. This is when we have a misrepresentation, but we don't have an infinite fictional system. These are cases in which two, so the limit system is not well defined, or um, a, one is empirically correct, that is the limit of the sequence of function is empirically correct, but uh, the infinite system is not. So these are cases in which Norton would say approximations cannot be promoted to idealizations because the infinite system is not well defined or it doesn't lead us to empirically correct results. We can also use um, infinite limits as idealizations yielding approximations. These are cases in which one and two, I remember, reminder you, this is one and this is two. These are cases in, what, in which one and two are well-defined and equal, so they coincide, and then bo they both give us empirically correct results. So these are cases in which there is an infinite system, but this infinite system can be interpreted as an approximation of finite systems in simple words. And there is another case which is going to be very controversial, very important for the debate on scientific realism, which is the case of essential idealization. So sometimes infinite limits might be used as essential idealizations. And this is when where a one and two, so the two limits that I mentioned before are well-defined, but they are not equal in two. So the, the infinite system instead of one, that is the limit of a sequence of function is empirically correct. So in these cases, the properties of the system evaluated in the infinite system don't seem to give us an approximation of the behavior of the system, of the finite system. And to this taxonomy for completeness, we can add the case of abstraction, which doesn't really fit with that formal setting, but it can be added to this list too. Abstraction, so one can also use infinite limits as abstractions, for example, when the variable n that goes to infinity doesn't represent any physical parameter of the target system. So in all these cases, n, the parameter that goes to infinity represents a physical system. We can have infinite, infinite limits as abstractions when the parameter in doesn't represent a physical parameter. Uh, I'm going to refer to this use of infinite limits as abstractions later because I think that might be interesting for, for some of you. So now let us discuss the paradox of infinite limits. So we know about different uses of infinite limits in our scientific models or our scientific theories. This use of scientific of, of um, infinite limits has led to or leads the scientific realists to a paradox that has been suggested in the, mainly in the context of phase transitions or in the context of other particular examples. So what we suggest here is that this paradox of infinite limits can be generalized to cover all cases of infinite uh, limits in physics. So this is how the paradox of infinite limits would look like, the generalized paradox of infinite limits. Uh, so the paradox of infinite limits arises as a contradiction between the following three statements. First of all, we assume that um, real systems are finite. As I said before, this is consistent with common sense. So we assume that in a glass of 
water they are not infinite particles and this is also consistent with well established background theories like the atomic theory of matter or even general the general theory of relativity uh, the second statement is that uh, is the indispensability of the limit system so in some cases it seems that the explanation of a phenomenon can only be given by means of an infinite system so by taking the limit of an infinite system um, and the third statement is the enhanced indispensability argument, which says that if a claim plays an indispensable role in the explanation of a phenomenon P, then we ought to believe in its existence. So it's, this is a paradox because, of course, we cannot um, accept the three statements uh, without falling into a contradiction. So we believe that the way of solving this paradox depends on the, on, on the use of the infinite limit. In, for some uses of infinite limits, the paradox is going to be a little bit more difficult to solve than in other uses of infinite limits. So let us now uh, go like analyze systematically how can we solve this paradox of infinite limits for the case uh, for different uses of, of, um, of infinite limits. So in the case of um, approximations without idealizations, the paradox doesn't seem to be very problematic. Actually, it doesn't even arise because the, we, we don't have infinite idealization. So these are cases in which the infinite idealization is not well defined or it doesn't cover recover empirically um, correct results. So in these cases, so we can basically solve this paradox by rejecting statement two. We don't even have an infinite idealization here that explains the phenomenon. Uh, an example of approximations without idealizations, a very uncontroversial example, I would say, is in special relativity. So we know that we can define the relevant quantities of special relativity by means of a uh, Lorentz factor, and that one can recover the classical quantities uh, from the relativistic quantities by taking the limit here of V over C uh, um, uh, square going to zero. In prima facie, there are different ways in which we might think we can, we can interpret this limit. But if we think a little bit, we will see that the only way of interpreting this limit is as an approximation in which we assume that the velocity of the bodies is very small with respect to the velocity with, with respect to the speed of light. We cannot interpret this uh, limit as an infinite idealization beca because we fall into some inconsistencies. For example, if we uh, try to interpret this uh, limit as the, the idea that C, the speed of light, go to, go to infinity, we might arrive to an infinite system, uh, but that, uh, an infinite system in which the, the bodies have infinite, uh, with, with the, sorry, where the speed of light has uh, infinite value, but we will also, in that infinite system, uh, see that the bodies have infinite energy which actually doesn't give an adequate description of target systems. So it seems that the only way, the only reasonable, plausible way of interpreting this limit here is as an approximation and not as an idealization. Another interesting aspect here is that uh, in this case, we have a very specific notion of approximate truth. So we can actually quantify the degree of misrepresentation for instance, by considering the terms of the serious expansion here that has been taken into account. So we can quantify how much we misrepresent realistic, uh, realistic behavior in our model by, uh, by taking into account how many terms of the serious expansion here have been considered. Uh, so there is a very, in sum, there is a very easy way of solving the paradox in the case in the case of approximations without idealization. So how can we solve the paradox in the case of idealizations yielding approximations? In a similar way, actually. So in this case, we said that the limit uh, of the sequence of functions and the and the limit the values of the limit system coincide, which means there is an infinite system here. 
but that infinite system give us an approximation of uh, the quantities evaluated for finite systems because the two limits coincide. So we can easily interpret this idealization as providing an approximation of realistic finite system. Uh, a little bit more formally, in these cases, one can show that as n goes to infinity, for some finite value, uh, n0 smaller than infinity, uh, characterizing a target system, the value of the function evaluated for the finite system approximates the value of the function evaluated for the infinite system in the sense that there is an arbitrary real epsilon bigger than zero, such that the difference of that value of the function for a finite system minus the value of the function for an infinite system is smaller than an epsilon. So in the traditional, in the traditional way. Uh, now, since uh, the infinite system gives since we know that the infinite system gives us approximately correct, give us, sorry, empirically correct results. This means uh, that the finite system also give us empirically correct results, provided of course that this epsilon is small enough, which can be uh, decided by, um, by taking into account empirical considerations. So, in short, in these cases of idealizations yielding approximations, one can also avoid the paradox by rejecting statement two, uh, that is by rejecting the indispensability of the limit system, because we can show that the limit system, so the infinite system, is just an approximation of the behavior of finite systems. An example of an idealization yielding approximation are reversible processes in thermodynamics. So here reversible processes are assumed to be processes that happen, that occur infinitely slow, and that can be represented as a continuous line in the phase space. So one can see that this representation, this infinite idealization is just an approximation of processes occurring not infinitely slow, but very slow. Uh, and since this is an idealization yielding an approximation, in this case, we also have a clear notion of approximate truth, which means that one can quantify the degree of misrepresentation of the infinite system with respect to a finite system in a similar way as what we do when we have approximations uh, without idealization. Just to, just to point it out, uh, Norton would actually disagree with this case of being an idealization yielding an approximation because he thinks that this uh, that's reversible process cannot be promoted to an idealization because that leads to paradoxical results. But Valente tried to solve that paradox that Norton suggested and we are following here Valente's approach. But the thing is that independently of whether you interpret reversible processes as approximations, yielding uh, um, as approximations without idealizations or as idealizations yielding approximations, you don't fall into the paradox because in both cases you can reject statement two, that is the indispensability of the, of the, of the uh, infinite system. So now let, let me sum up what I have said um, until now. So in the case of infinite idealizations yielding approximations, and in the case of limits as approximations without idealizations, one can avoid the paradox by rejecting statement two. So that means that the paradox uh, doesn't pose any challenge for the scientific realism when we use uh, infinite limits in this way. Moreover, actually this uh, misrepresentation, this use of, of infinite limits has some advantages upon other types of idealizations or other misrepresentations in the sense that there is a very clear notion of approximate truth, which in general is very problematic for, the, for scientific realism. So instead of being problematic for, for scientific realism, the use of infinite limits in this sense is actually compatible with, the, with um, scientific realism and has some advantages upon other idealizations because we have a nice notion of approximate true or a nice note, we can quantify the degree of misrepresentation in other words. But now let us revise a more controversial case that is when infinite, when infinite limits are used as essential idealizations. So this is supposed to be the most and is actually the most 
controversial case and the most problematic case from the perspective of this of scientific realism. So as I said before, essential idealizations occur when the limit of the sequence of values doesn't coincide with the value of the quantities evaluated in the limit system. And it is rather the second than the first, the one that is empirically adequate. This of course suggests that we need the, the limit system, so we need the infinite system in order to recover empirically correct results. And we need the infinite system in order to account for some phenomena. So infinite idealization seems to be here indispensable to, to the explanation of a phenomenon. And it seems that no finite system actually can yield empirically correct results for the phenomenon that we want to, that we want to explain or that we want to predict. So as I said, these are the most complicated, the most uh, controversial cases and the most problematic cases for the, from the perspective of a scientific realist. And these um, cases of essential idealizations have been called cases of singular limits in the literature on infinite limits. It's important to know. So let us see some examples, some putative examples of essential idealizations in, in science. The most, one of the most important examples or putative examples of essential idealizations is the case of first order phase transitions, which actually was the case that started the discussion on the paradox of infinite limits in, in the literature in philosophy of science. Uh, I will not go into details in this example, but I will just try to explain it to you in very, in very simple terms. And um, so phase, uh, phase transitions are these sudden changes in the phenomenological properties of a system that we observe, for example, when liquid water changes to, to vapor. Uh, in thermodynamics, uh, the thermodynamic quantities that describe this behavior uh, are discontinuous. So in thermodynamics, phase transitions are represented in terms of discontinuities in the derivatives of the free energy. Now, from the perspective of statistical mechanics, uh, we define the free energy in terms of the partition function. And the partition function is a sum of analytic functions that cannot display these continuities unless we take the thermodynamic limit. So it seems that the only way of recovering these, these continuities that give an, an empirically adequate description of first or the phase transition is by taking the thermodynamic limit uh, by which the number of particles and the volume of the system goes to infinity. So this is a very important case of apparent essential idealizations in, in, in science. And this seems to be a case that fall into a paradox because we cannot get rid of statement two of the paradox of infinite limits so easily. So in a way here, the limit system uh, seems to be indispensable to recover empirically correct results. So what can we do? There are different strategies here that have been adopted in, in order to solve this paradox, in particular for the case of, of phase transitions. Uh, Liu, for example, suggests rejecting statement one. This is the less popular strategy because not so many philosophers want to reject the finiteness of real systems. Uh, some authors we interpret as rejecting statement three, that is Baron and Shech. Maybe Shech will disagree with this interpretation of his view, but that's how we interpret it in this general formulation of paradox of infinite limits. And there are many philosophers that try to solve this paradox by rejecting statement two. Uh, what we are going to do now is also endorse this view and reject the and solve the paradox or try to solve the paradox by rejecting statement two, but with some caveats with respect to, to previous authors. So let me review now uh, uh, attempts to solve this paradox, for example, by rejecting statement one, that is the statement of finiteness of real systems. So Liu, for example, argues for, so gives up to a more traditional view of, of uh, scientific realism and adopts con uh, um, a view of contextual realism. So he defends contextual realism according to which claims uh, are always relative to background theories. So for example, the claim that um, a system is infinite 
might be true, but in, uh, but in relation to a background theory like condensed matter physics. Since condensed matter physics requires this essential idealization, so it requires that the number of particles goes to infinity, then we can believe that that, uh, that claim is true, but it's in particular with respect to condensed matter physics. So this might be a solution if you want to defend contextual realism, but I think from a perspective, from more traditional perspective of scientific realism, uh, and mainly from the perspective of explanatorianism, uh, this solution would not be very satisfactory. So this is not satisfactory if we want to defend more traditional view of scientific realism. So a scientific realist might wonder whether there are other ways of solving the paradox that doesn't imply revising the notion of, of realism. Another option is rejecting uh, statement uh, three, that is the enhanced indispensability argument. So this was suggested very recently by Baron in 2019. He distinguishes between constructive indispensability and substantive indispensability. So he says that constructive indispensability uh, occurs when, or a claim is constructive indispensable, when there is reason to believe that such an entity or such an idealization can be dispensed, but we don't know yet how. So this constructive indispensability is for him not harmful for scientific realism, because we don't have to commit ourselves with parts of the, of the theory that are just constructive indispensable. And substantive indispensable is a little bit more uh, important because in this case, there is no reason to suppose that an entity or an idealization can ever be dispensed. And how can we judge whether we have a case of constructive indispensability of substantive indispensability? Baron proposes a test of coherence. So he says that if a claim is not consistent with other accepted theories, it is only constructively indispensable. And he thinks that this is the case of phase transition. So um, assuming that the number of particles is infinite is not consistent with background theories like atomic theory and general theory of relativity. And therefore we should believe that that indispensability is only constructive indispensability. So for us, this um, strategy sounds a little bit unsatisfactory too because it seems to beg the question and it seems to be an ad hoc answer. So actually what we want to do is to explain this apparent need for the thermodynamic limit and this apparent contradiction between this uh, idealization and other background theories. So another, uh, Czech suggests what we believe is another, another attempt to reject statement three. So he basically notes that terms related to infinite systems don't refer to concrete physical systems, but to mathematical objects with no ontological significance. So basically he says that we shouldn't take infinite systems so seriously and therefore we shouldn't make any ontological claim about, about infinite systems. Uh, the problem with this view, so this view is very, it's very, it's very uh, acceptable if you, if you are in, an instrumentalist, but from the point of a scientific realist, that's also not a very good solution because as Sheikh himself recognizes, um, realists are interested in our abstract scientific accounts, getting something right about the world. So a realist might not be very satisfied with this way of replying either. So it seems that the only option that we have is to reject statement two that is to reject the indispensability of the limit system, even in cases in which the limit system appears to be indispensable. And this is the strategy that Butterfield took in 2011. So his solution to the paradox by rejecting uh, statement two is twofold. First of all, he says that we should focus on the relevant properties uh, that explained a certain phenomenon and not, not on the irrelevant properties. And he points out that if we focus on the right properties, on the relevant properties, then we will see that they are represented by functions that are actually not singular limits. Uh, and by focusing on these properties, then we will conclude that the behavior that is observed at the limit so in the infinite idealization also arises on the way to the limit. So in other words, we would see 
that the behavior of the limit is just an approximation of the behavior of finite systems. And how he supports this conclusion, so he relies on a toy model that I will briefly explain. So imagine, uh, consider this sequence of functions, G. Uh, this sequence of functions uh, converge to this discontinuous function here, G infinity, when we take the limit of N going to infinity. And this convergence is smooth, so it converges smoothly. This is not at all a case of a singular limit. But now we can define another function, let's call it F, that takes values depending on the behavior of Gn. For example, we can give it a value one to this uh, function f if gn is continuous, and we can give uh, a value zero if gn is discontinuous. So if we focus on this quantity f, we might conclude that the value for when g is continuous is different from the value, is very different and is not approximated by the value when gn is discontinuous. And according to him, this is exactly the mistake that people are making in the case of first order phase transition because they are focusing on the second order function that takes value on the relevant function. In fact, he says that if we focus on, he says that the uh, magnetization in the case of first order phase transitions acts like a uh, function G. So it's actually a smooth function that uh, approaches smoothly the limit in which there is the discontinuity. So if we focus on the relevant quantity here on the magnetization, we will see that the limit is not singular in the sense that we defined before. And, and that's how he solved basically the paradox of uh, infinite limits uh, for cases, for apparent cases of essential idealizations. But now the question is, how general is uh, Butterfield's solution? So <clears throat> many philosophers have tried to uh, give a deflationary interpretation of the thermodynamic limit and only infinite idealizations by considering other examples different as first order phase transitions. And there has been important work addressing the case of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, for example, Fraser, Lanzmann, and Wallace have tried to give a deflationary interpretation of the thermodynamic limit in the case of spontaneous symmetry breaking. But they have all pointed out that the solution or the deflationary interpretation of the thermodynamic limit in this case is much less straightforward than in the case of first order phase transition. So it's not about looking at the right quantity um, that we will observe will uh, converge smoothly towards the limit. It's also about trying to redefine uh, uh, or trying to give a different inter different definition to the notion of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking that we will uh, give a deflationary interpretation of, of the thermodynamic limit. So let me uh, uh, discuss now Fraser's position on this on on this um, uh, on this matter. So. Just to give you a very a very short introduction to spontaneous symmetry breaking in case you are not familiar with it. These are cases in which a symmetry, uh, the symmetry of a system is lost, for example, when we change the value of some external parameter. In the case of, of a magnet, for example, a ma at high temperatures, a magnet has um, one equilibrium state that is symmetric under up-down symmetry, but at a certain temperature, there will be two possible equilibria and the magnet will actualize just one of this equilibrium. Uh, and that equilibrium will not be symmetric under up-down symmetry anymore. So this kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking needs also the assumption of the thermodynamic limit. So Fraser said that we could still give a uh, deflationary interpretation of the thermodynamic limit in this case, but what we need to do is to relax the assumptions that allow one to give a rigorous definition of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, in particular, in the case of ferromagnetism, one should relax either the assumption that there is only one uh, minima, that only one of the minima is actually realized, 
or that the symmetry breaking is actually spontaneous. So how can we uh, relax the assumption that only one of the minima is actually realized? One can relax this assumption, for example, avoiding taking the infinite time limit and focusing instead on the behavior of the, of the system for a finite time scale. In this case, there will be no strict symmetry breaking, so there will be no uh, strict ergodicity breaking, but we will have symmetry breaking or ergodicity breaking for a certain finite scale. Another option is um, to give up to the assumption or to relax the assumption that symmetry breaking is actually spontaneous, and we might allow for a very small external field. So a external field that is uh, has a very small value, but, that, but a value that is different from zero. This, this proposal is very close to what uh, Lanzmann suggested. So he said that uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in finite systems can be the result of small asymmetries arising from environmental effects. So it seems that we can still give a deflationary interpretation of the thermodynamic limit or the infinite idealization here, but that interpretation is a little bit less straightforward than in the case of um, first order phase transition. So an open question is how general this is. Uh, so it remains to be shown that all interesting cases of symmetry, spontaneous symmetry breaking, including the Higgs boson, for example, and other cases like quantum phase transition can be interpreted in a, in a, in a similar deflationary matter. But the thing is that if we are going to resolve the paradox, we, we need to uh, give a deflationary interpretation to essential idealizations. Just so the more Patricia, I, we, you are uh, about four minutes uh, past uh, 45 minutes. Um, so uh, if we do run out of time for a Q&A right now, we can always uh, save that for the hour at the end. Uh, but we, we should take a five minute break before the next hour. So you have about six minutes. I have about I have six minutes in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I really wanted to go to the infinite idealist, infinite, the use of uh, infinite limits as abstraction. So I will do my best for making it short. So the moral of this part is that <clears throat> it seems that the most plausible solution to the paradox, which is also realism friendly, relies on a deflationary interpretation of the infinite idealization, which in other words would mean rejecting statement two of the paradox. All the other solutions don't seem to be satisfactory from a realistic point of view. There have been some good attempts of, of um, giving a deflationary interpretation of apparent essential idealizations, as in the case of finite um, of first or the phase transitions and uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, but it remains to be seen whether we can give a deflationary interpretation of all important essential, apparent essential idealizations that we use in physics. So whether this and how this deflationary interpretation can be given depends on empirical research and should be decided on a case by case basis. So let me now very, very briefly go to infinite limits as abstraction because I think this is a novel part of the paper even if we don't have that much time. Um, <clears throat> so what, one of the other things that we point out in the paper is that infinite limits can be used as abstractions. So not only as idealizations or as approximations, sometimes they can be used as abstractions. Uh, and the example of the use of infinite idealizations, infinite limits, sorry, as abstractions is uh, a renormalization group method, the use of renormalization group methods, for example, for the explanation of, um, of continuous phase transitions. So why this can be interpreted as abstraction? Because in the, in the renormalization group methods, there is an infinite limit involved that has to do with the number of iterations of the renormalization group transformation. Uh, that means that, the, in, which is actually repeated infinitely many times, uh, which means that the parameter here that goes to infinity, it doesn't represent a physical quantity. So it just represents the number of iterations of the renormalization group transformation. And what we do when we, when we use a renormalization group transformation, for example, when we want to, to give an explanation of condensed matter um, of a continuous phase transition, is that at every step, we get rid of the irrelevant coupling constants. So it seems that this is 
a process of infinite abstraction in which we subsequently abstract more and more the system until we arrive at a fixed point, which is the most abstract coarse grain model, which is the one that is going to allow us to give an explanation of universality. Um, so this is interesting because the use of infinite limits as abstraction hasn't been discussed in this sense so much. Is this problematic for, for uh, realism? So many, some philosophers have pointed out that um, the use of renormalization group methods is problematic for scientific realism because we need a fixed point in order to give an account of universality and that fixed point requires the appealing to an infinite system. But um, I have offered a few years ago a solution to this problem uh, in which, well, which has several steps that I will summarize now. Uh, so first of all, uh, in order to solve this problem, one needs to realize that there are two infinite limits involved here. So we have the thermodynamic limit, which is the infinite idealization that implies taking the number of particles to infinity. And we also have the infinite iteration limit, which can be, can be read as an infinite abstraction in which the, the number of iterations of the renormalization group transformation go to infinity. Second, one needs to note that these two limits don't commute. So one has to take necessarily the, um, the thermodynamic limit before the infinite time limit, if we take the, before the, the infinite iteration limit. If we take the infinite iteration limit before the, the thermodynamic limit, then we will arrive at a trivial fixed point that will not allow us to um, recover empirically correct results. But what we can do in order to give a deflationary interpretation of this is that we can study the behavior on the way to the thermodynamic limit and then on the way to the infinite iteration limit. And if we do that, then we will observe by analyzing the topology of renormalization group methods or by using a Monte Carlo a simulation that the behavior on the way to the limits, on the way to these two limits, approximates the behavior at the fixed point. So that's the summary of how we can solve the problem of um, uh, the use of renormalization group methods from a realistic perspective. A uh, interesting caveat here is that even if we show that the, the infinite limits or the, yeah, the infinite limits are not essential for the explanation of universality, it seems that the coarse graining procedure is somehow uh, essential because we need a coarse graining procedure in order to give an account of universality. But this coarse graining procedure doesn't have to be performed infinitely, infinitely many, many times. So we can just uh, apply the renormalization group transformation finitely many times, but, but um, as many times as necessary to give a, a, an explanation of universality. So the coarse graining procedure is essential, but it's essential in the same way as abstract explanations are ex essential to explain common behavior among disparate systems. So this way in which the coarse graining procedure is essential is absolutely compatible with realism. Uh, and we also have, have here a notion of approximate truth that we can discuss in the Q&A. So now I finish. So what I have said is it seems that the only way of solving the paradox of infinite limits seems to be uh, by rejecting uh, statement two and how we reject statement two, that is the indispensability of the limit system depends on the use of infinite limit. In the case of approximations without abstractions, we have no paradox because the infinite idealization is not well defined or it doesn't recover empirically correctness, so empirically correct results. In the case of idealizations yielding approximations, there is no paradox because uh, the real target system recovers empirically correct results and the properties of the limit system just approximate them. In the case of essential idealization, there is no paradox also but only if uh, for, rel for physically relevant properties, one recovers empirically correctness on the way to the limit. Uh, and in the case of abstraction, there is no paradox per se, since they don't involve misrepresentation, but we can, can fall in principle into the paradox if we combine abstractions with essential idealizations, which appear to be the case of uh, continuous phase transition. And that's 
all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Um, so um, we are unfortunately out of time for um, uh, for for the you know Q and A that we would have had after this talk. That's fine. We will save questions uh, that people have um, for the final hour at the end of of the workshop. Um, I want to give people a chance to take a break. Uh, I'll I'll just ask that. Uh, well, let me stop the recording now. <laughs>